Welcome to G Fun Facts Online. From rockets tearing through the atmosphere to the precise blasts that carve tunnels through solid rock, controlled explosions are the hidden force behind some of our greatest achievements. Today, we're diving into the heart of the matter, the incredible chemistry and physics of energetic materials. It's a story that starts with alchemists seeking eternal life and ends with an airbag saving one. The journey begins over a thousand years ago in 9th century China. Taoist alchemists weren't looking for a weapon, they were searching for an elixir of immortality while mixing and heating various substances. They stumbled upon a concoction that, instead of granting life, produced a startling flash and a puff of smoke. They had just invented the world's first chemical explosive, gunpowder, which we now call black powder. The first recorded formula from around 1044 AD lists a simple but effective trio, saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. Here's how it works. The charcoal provides carbon, which is the fuel. The sulfur lowers the temperature needed for ignition and speeds up the reaction. But the real secret ingredient is the saltpeter, or potassium nitrate. It acts as the oxidizer, supplying all the oxygen needed for the rapid combustion. This is the key difference between an explosive and a regular fuel. A log in a fire has to pull oxygen from the air around it. Black powder brings its own oxygen to the party, packed right into the mixture. Initially, it was used for fireworks and fire arrows, but its military potential was undeniable. By the 13th century, knowledge of gunpowder had spread across the globe, thanks in part to the Mongol conquests. This led to the first guns, which were essentially bamboo tubes using black powder to shoot a projectile. For hundreds of years, black powder was the undisputed king of explosives, changing warfare and powering the first major civil engineering projects like mining. The next giant leap in explosive power didn't happen until the mid-19th century. In 1846, an Italian chemist named Ascanio Sobrero was working in a lab in Paris. By carefully dripping glycerol into a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acids, he created a new oily liquid that was terrifyingly powerful, nitroglycerin. Sobrero was horrified by what he'd made. He discovered that a single drop, when heated or struck, would detonate with a violence that made black powder look like a firecracker. He was convinced it was too dangerous and unstable for any practical use, and warned the world against it. But in that same lab was a young Swedish student named Alfred Nobel. Where Sobrero saw only danger, Nobel saw revolutionary potential. He believed if he could tame nitroglycerin's power, he could transform construction and industry. His quest was filled with tragedy. In 1864, a catastrophic explosion at his family's factory killed five people, including his younger brother, Emil. This disaster only hardened Nobel's resolve to find a safer way to handle the volatile liquid. After years of relentless experimentation, he found the answer. Nobel discovered that if he absorbed the liquid nitroglycerin into a porous, inert clay called Kieselger, he created a stable, solid, putty-like material. It retained all the explosive power of nitroglycerin, but was vastly safer to handle and transport. In 1867, he patented this invention, calling it dynamite. To make it work reliably, he also had to invent the blasting cap, a small, sensitive primary explosive that could initiate the main, less sensitive dynamite charge, a principle we still use today. Nobel's work didn't stop there. He later created gelignite, an even more powerful, water-resistant explosive. These inventions literally changed the face of the Earth, making it possible to build tunnels, canals, and railways on a scale never before imagined. The 20th century and its two world wars accelerated development even further. The focus shifted to creating explosives that were not just powerful, but also incredibly stable and safe to mass produce and pack into shells. This is where we meet the famous TNT, or Trinitro Toluene. First prepared in 1863, TNT became the benchmark for military explosives. 
Its main advantage was its relative insensitivity to shock and friction. You could handle it, transport it, and even melt it down to cast it into shells without it blowing up. Though less powerful than pure nitroglycerin, its stability was a game changer. Then came even more powerful compounds. RDX, or Research Department Explosive, is a nitroamine that is significantly more potent than TNT. During World War II, it became a key ingredient in plastic explosives like Composition C-4, where it's mixed with plasticizers to create a malleable, putty-like charge that can be molded to any shape. A cousin of RDX is HMX, or High Melting Explosive. It's even denser and more powerful, used in applications that require maximum performance, like the shaped charges in anti-tank missiles. But what is actually happening inside these molecules to unleash such power? At its heart, an energetic material is a molecule that stores a huge amount of chemical energy. Crucially, it contains both its fuel, usually carbon and hydrogen, and its oxidizer, typically in the form of nitro groups. Having the fuel and oxidizer chemically bonded together in the same molecule allows for an incredibly fast, self-sustaining reaction that doesn't need any oxygen from the outside air. The energy is locked in relatively weak chemical bonds. When the molecule decomposes, these weak bonds break, and the atoms rearrange themselves to form incredibly strong, stable molecules, like nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and water. This transition from weak bonds to strong bonds releases a massive amount of energy. To understand how well an explosive performs, scientists use a critical concept called oxygen balance. This is simply a measure of whether an explosive molecule has enough of its own oxygen to completely burn all of its carbon and hydrogen. A molecule with zero oxygen balance has the perfect amount of oxygen. This is the theoretical ideal for maximum energy release. A molecule with a positive oxygen balance has too much oxygen, like nitroglycerin, but most explosives have a negative oxygen balance, meaning they don't have enough oxygen. The classic example is TNT. When TNT detonates, there isn't enough oxygen to turn all the carbon into carbon dioxide. The chemical equation is roughly two TNT molecules become three nitrogen gas molecules, five water molecules, seven carbon monoxide molecules, and seven atoms of pure, solid carbon. That solid carbon is the characteristic black, sooty smoke you see from a TNT explosion. It's also wasted energy. The carbon monoxide could have burned further to become carbon dioxide if there was more oxygen. So how do you fix this? You mix it with something that has extra oxygen. This led to the invention of amytal, a mixture of oxygen-negative TNT and oxygen-positive ammonium nitrate. A mixture of 80% ammonium nitrate and 20% TNT creates an explosive with an almost perfect oxygen balance, making it about 30% more powerful than TNT alone. Now we know what's in these materials, but how do they release their energy? This is where we encounter a fundamental difference in physics, deflagration versus detonation. Deflagration is essentially very, very rapid burning. The reaction moves through the material at subsonic speeds, slower than the speed of sound, energy is transferred by heat. Think of a propellant in a bullet cartridge or a rocket motor. You don't want it to explode. You want it to burn at a controlled, predictable rate to produce a sustained push. The confinement inside a gun barrel or rocket chamber builds up pressure, which speeds up the burn rate, creating the force needed to propel a projectile. Low explosives, like black powder and modern propellants, deflagrate. Detonation, on the other hand, is a completely different beast. It is a far more violent phenomenon. Here, the reaction front travels at supersonic speeds, anywhere from 2,000 to over 9,000 meters per second. The driving force isn't heat, it's a brutal, powerful shockwave. This shockwave is an almost instantaneous spike in pressure and density. As this wave rips through the unreacted material, it compresses it so violently and heats it so intensely 
that it forces the chemical decomposition to happen instantly. The energy released from that decomposition then feeds back into the shock wave, sustaining it and driving it forward. It's a self-propagating supersonic wave of destruction. High explosives like TNT, RDX and PETN are designed to detonate. Scientists model this process with something called the ZND model. It pictures the detonation wave as having three parts. First, the leading shock front hits the unreacted material. Immediately behind it, the pressure skyrockets to a peak called the von Neumann spike. Then, in the reaction zone, the explosive decomposes, releasing energy and causing the pressure to drop. Finally, the reaction is complete and the stable detonation continues on. The shattering power of a high explosive comes from this initial shock wave, not just the expanding gas. This brings us to how we classify energetic materials. First, we have explosives, which are designed to detonate. They're split into three subgroups based on sensitivity. Primary explosives, like lead azide, are extremely sensitive to heat, friction, or impact. They're too dangerous for bulk use so they're used in tiny amounts inside blasting caps to start the reaction. Secondary explosives are the workhorses, TNT, RDX, C4. They are relatively insensitive and need the powerful shock from a primary explosive to detonate, which makes them safe to handle and transport. Finally, there are tertiary explosives or blasting agents. These are so insensitive they can't even be set off by a blasting cap. They need a detonate 